Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Natalie Stetson. I'm the executive director here at the Erie Canal Museum. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. We appreciate that so many people have taken time from their day to join us and to support the work that we're doing here at the Erie Canal Museum. My favorite part of the museum's mission is that we work to explore the transforming effects of the Erie Canal on the past, the present, and the future. Understanding and analyzing history is an important part of creating a more just future. Museums like us, in the way that we choose to interpret and share stories, have a big responsibility to being part of the solution. The impact of the Erie Canal was immense, socially, economically, and politically. It continues to impact the world that we live in today. Tomorrow, the Erie Canal opens for its 197th season. Today, we will hear about the work that is done in the off season to keep the modern day, but still a century old canal operational. This is our fifth lunchtime lecture of 2022 with this year's theme being infrastructure. The program was funded in part by New York, uh, by Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our next lunchtime lecture is on June 16th and will also be a hybrid event with both in-person and virtual options. That lecture will feature Shane Blevelt, Honeywell Senior Remediation Manager, and he will come to discuss the progress on recreational and sustainability projects at Onondaga Lake, including the restoration of more than 90 acres of wetlands that provide a habitat to nearly 290 wildlife species. The day before our next lunchtime lecture, June 15th, is our next history happy hour that we're hosting with our friends Talking Cursive Brewery just on the other side of Clinton Square from us. That event begins at 5 p.m. and then at 6.30, there will be a presentation by um, museum educator Derek Pratt, who's here, uh, <laughs> the disembodied voice that you've all, all heard a few times now. Um, and Derek will be examining the, the history of a boat that once called the location of Talking Cursive Brewery home, um, John Greenway's canal yacht named the Annie Laurie. We are also not too far away from the beginning of cycling season here at the Erie Canal Museum. Our Tour of the Towpath initiative includes the return of our popular Beer Spikes and Barges series, a two-day cycling event from Rome to Syracuse, uh, and also some free guided rides. If you want more information about our cycling events, we have a website dedicated to them, eriecanalmuseum.org slash cycling, and you can find all the details about all the events. We hope some of you will be able to join us for those. And now I will stop babbling on and pass the microphone over onto the main event. Um, we are very happy to welcome Ambrose Barbudo, Director of Waterway Maintenance with the New York State Canal Corporation, who's going to give us a brief overview of what of that work that has to be done each year. So please join me in welcoming Ambrose. Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. It is afternoon, right? Um, so as Natalie said, I'm here to talk about the work we do on the canal during the winter. I mean, that's um, one of the biggest questions I ever get is, you know, what happens during the winter? Do you guys close up shop? Do you lay off all your seasonal employees? And it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, anyone who's been on the canal knows during the season, it's impossible to shut down a lock or any other structure because the whole system would be shut down. So really the winter is when we do the heart of our work. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit today. A Little bit about myself. Um, I graduated from the University of Buffalo a long time ago. Um, I worked for the state DOT for a few years, but I've been with the Canal Corp since 1999. Um, spent a little bit of time in there with the Thruway when we were together, but the bulk of those years have been with the Canal Corp. So. I feel like now I'm, I am one of the senior people where when I came in, I was one of the young bucks. So uh, we'll just get through this here. Oh, let me see here, let me use this mouse. Okay, so a little bit about the canal system. 524 miles is the entire length. Um, that includes the four canals, the Erie, the Champlain, the Oswego and the Cayuga Seneca. We also have three large lakes, or four, Cayuga Seneca, Cross Lake, and Oneida Lake. We also have a reservoir system. We have southern and northern reservoirs up in the Adirondacks and down in Madison County. Most of those reservoirs were used for the original Erie Canal and no longer are used for the current, but we do have water from Delta and Hinkley lakes and reservoirs that we do currently use. Um, I'm going to show you a map in a second here. We're broken up into two regions across the state. 
And within those regions, there's eight maintenance sections. And amongst the over 3,000 structures, almost 3,000, we have 57 locks, 16 lift bridges, multiple tainter gates, sluice gates, and I'm going to show you some of those structures next. So this is just a map showing the breakdown of our system. Um, the purple area is the western region of the state. The green is the eastern region. Within there, as I said, there's eight maintenance sections which break up those regions into you know, approximately 30 to 40 miles of canal section that a, a maintenance has a maintenance jurisdiction. Um, so I oversee pretty much both regions, the regional engineers that take care of all report to me. Um, we have roughly about 400 employees within maintenance and operations. So, you know, of our 460 or so employees corporation wide, as you can see, the bulk of those are within maintenance. Um, you know, we do vary quite a bit, like in the summer, we will add about almost 200 seasonal temporary employees to that number to help operate the locks and, you know, man our vessels. And then in the winter, we won't add quite as much, but we'll add about 70 employees to help us with a lot of this work that you're going to see here in a minute. Um, so I just, I want to give a brief overview of some of our structures. I'm sure many of you probably being canal enthusiasts know quite a bit about them, but I just show you some, I mean, locks are, are, you know, predominant feature that most people know about 57 of those across the system. Um, and, and that's where we do the bulk of our work in the winter time, because those, we really cannot do much lock work in the summer. I mean, to, to, You'll see some of the dams and stuff we set up at these locks to get work done on them. I mean, there's other structures I'll show you, like, for example, a tainter gate. Um, this is a tainter gate in Codnoy, which basically controls the entire level of a Nida Lake. So, you know, we can get in there and work on a gate or work on a motor in the summer. But uh, unlike a lock, um, you just can't you can't do that in the in the in the summer on a lock. Um, we have a lot of dams and spillways, those um, reservoirs that I talked to you about earlier. This is up at, uh, I believe this is Delta Dam up, up in the Rome area. Very large structures that were built, you know, early 1900s, some even further back than that, that we maintain as well. Um, the Mohawk Dams, anyone who's driven along the thruway headed east to Albany have seen the Mohawk Dams. Many people think they're a bridge, a bridge to nowhere because you can't really drive on them. But uh, this is how we control the level of the Mohawk River. We lift those all out during the winter as well to prevent flooding and ice jams. Um, you know, they're one of this type of structures predominantly in this on this canal and not many other areas. That's why they call it a Mohawk Dam. And lift bridges, we have several lift bridges, mainly in the western part of the state. Um, 16 in all, I believe, and 13 of those are in that western region, west of Rochester, roughly. Guard gates, this is another large structure that we have across the system. Um, many of them in the western part of the state as well, which we can isolate certain areas of the canal if need be. You can put a guard gate down on either side of a stretch of canal, dewater it if need be. Uh, we also, in many areas, put these down in the winter so that we can drain the sections of the canal. Um, they're also, you know, in, in case you have a leak or something in an embankment, you can isolate that area, dewater it, make the repair, and then get back up and running in a short order of time. Otherwise, without these, we wouldn't be able to. There's also some of these at the head of certain locks, and I'll show you that in a minute when we get to some of our, our work photos. And then a variety of other structures, as I said, that make up the almost 3,000 structures that we have across our system. There's structures from the historic Erie Canal, there's buildings, old walkway bridges, um, even old locks in some areas that we still maintain. So the main uh, project I'm going to talk about today is our, we call it our pump out. We call it our pump out because you basically isolate a lock, you'll set a dam on either end, and then you drain all the water out so that our employees can get in there and make the repairs that are necessary. Um, 
you know, during the winter, as I said, we boost up our numbers a little bit with some seasonal help. There's about 450 maintenance employees, and most of them are somehow, you know, will work on that pump out, um, whether it's help in the shop, fabricating parts, or direct labor right on the lock itself. We have electricians, carpenters, welders, crane operators. They will all take a part in that pump out to help us do the work that we'll show you next. Um, each costs about a million dollars, and that's we do pretty much all that work in house with our own labor. Um, we do eight per year, one per section. That I said we had eight sections. We do about one per year, and most of the sections have between eight and ten locks. So that naturally puts it on about a ten-year cycle. You do it, you, you move on to the next lock, and then you get back there about ten years later to do it again. So it's not. It, it wouldn't be considered a major rehabilitation. It's basically some preventative maintenance. You get in there, you repair parts, you replace parts so that it will last another 10 years when you can do it again. So the basic scope of a pump out is, you know, as we said, we'll set up those coffer dams on either end of the lock. Um, the valves that control the water in and out of the lock get taken out and rehabilitated. Um, the miter gates that, you know, open and close the doors, for lack of a better word, that let boats in and out, those are removed and rehabilitated. Um, the coin and miter wood, which is on the gates, and I'll show you pictures of all this, that gets replaced. It's made of solid oak. You know, it's best wood we, we've ever, they've used it for 200 years. You know, we've tried other replacements, but nothing quite lasts like oak. Uh, the pivots and sockets with those gates right on in the corners are replaced. And then we'll do some miscellaneous concrete repair. Obviously, in the middle of winter, it's hard to do wholesale concrete repair, but we will do some minor concrete repair. So this is, you know, when we get that lock all pumped out, this is typically what you'll find. Um, Buildup of some siltation debris, zebra mussels in certain areas. The whole bottom of that lock will be full with zebra mussels. Um, you know, so a lot of times we have a, a general idea of what the condition of the, the components will be and the lock will be. But as you will see in some photos, you really don't have a hundred percent idea until you get in there and you can see everything in the dry. So, you know, we, I would say probably 80 to 85%, we know exactly what we're going to be doing, but there's always that monkey wrench you get thrown at you because, you couldn't see it because it was underwater for the last six, seven months. So this is how we install our coffer dams. Um, there's a few different methods, but the most, you know, the most common one is we will lay a beam across the lock and then these steel sheets will get placed along that beam. They lock in together and it basically forms a barrier on either end of the lock so water cannot come in. Um, we'll seal around the edges and then we'll also end up putting some small pumps in the lock for any little bit of water that may, you know, penetrate through. Um, most times they do a pretty good job of sealing it up, um, but there's always a little bit of water. Um, this is just another a different cofferdam type. Um, as I said earlier, the beam you saw that was laid across the lock, this is called a swing beam. And these were built into the lock itself. So when we need to do a pump out, we'll swing that beam out. It's already there. And then we just lay our sheets against it. So just another method of uh, pumping the lockdown. And then this is the third option. I told you, you know, I showed you some guard gates. Some of our locks, especially the locks that are adjacent to a large water body, we have a guard gate right at the head of that lock so that when we're ready to do a pump out, we don't have to set up that coffer dam with the beams and everything. We can just drop that gate and pretty much we're ready to go. Um, so these are the valves I talked about. There's one in each corner. Um, this is called a wagon body valve because basically it rides like a wagon body up and down. It has wheels. Um, that's what it looks like when it comes out. We'll pull those out. Um, we'll send all our valves to our main shop in Waterford, New York, just outside of Albany. They'll go through the entire valve. They'll replace all the components, as you can see here. They'll paint it. And basically, when it comes back, it's like brand new. We have several machinists 
in that shop that basically, you know, the parts that we have on our system, um, you can't go somewhere and just buy them. So we pretty much make the majority of our parts. We do have some of them cast or forged from different companies, from patterns that we had since the locks were built. But, um, you know, pretty much all that rehab work we do in house. And this is just a different type of valve. This is called a butterfly valve. So instead of riding up and down in that corner, it will just twist, um, you know, so you twist it 90 degrees and it's basically open. Um, and these we have predominantly at our hydraulic driven locks. The other valves there are at our mechanical motor driven locks. And there's one that's completely rehabilitated, ready to go back in. Um, they'll get delivered right on site. And then our folks, our crane operators, along with our, our laborers, will put that back into that corner. Um, just there's a view of one going in, it's hanging on the crane, getting ready to put in the valve well. And that's what it looks like when it's, it's back in, in place. Everything's painted, new cables or chains are put on that basically you know, lift and lower that valve. And that's what it looks like when it's done. Uh, the other big item is our miter gates. Um, you know, we'll get in there as soon as we pump the lock down. We'll get in there with our folks. We'll, we'll pressure wash them so you can really, our engineers can get a good look at them. Um, sometimes you'll find cracks. You know, you'll find obviously um, some of the older riveted or welded connections need to be replaced. Like anytime we take these out, a lot of those connections are replaced with bolted connections because you don't get the cracking from all the fatigue of moving back and forth. So as we go through, we've been doing that over the years. Um, so we'll take those out, we'll lay them on the ground. Um, that's something we kind of knew that we've been doing the last several, a few years. Um, we, we would set up scaffolding and basically just lift the gate in place so that they could work on it. But what we found is it's much safer if we can take these out, lay them on the ground. Our welders and other employees have a much safer working area. Plus they don't have to be working off a of scaffolding for seven, eight hours a day to do welding. And there it is laying on the ground. We typically will rent those large cranes because you know that's on the magnitude of maybe a 400 ton crane. So we don't, we have smaller cranes, but you know, not, not those bigger ones. Um, and this is, as I said, you know, these connections were typically riveted or welded. And we found through modern engineering that, that that's not a good combination when you've got something that's moving several times a day. So we go in, we, we replace it with bolts and um, it's good for, for a long time. A lot of our gates have been replaced since you know, original construction in the early 1900s, but we still do have quite a few original um, that eventually will need to get replaced. Um, as I said, there's a gate in place working off of scaffolding. Um, many times they will set it in place and, you know, do some touch up, finish painting and things of that sort. And there's another repair, you know, that, that was, I'm assuming was a crack that they found in that skin plate. So they will weld that up and put a, a new plate over the top of it. Now this is the, um, the, well, this is the miter wood. So the miter wood is where the, when the two gates close, they meet right in the middle and that's oak strips that, and oak is great because when it's in the water, it swells just a little bit, you know, get that nice tight seal when those two pieces meet together right in the middle. So we'll go through, we'll replace that. These are not too bad. I mean, these are probably, you know, eight inches by six inches, but the, um, the coins, which you see in the, those are what's in the corner. Those have to come from large, like 16 by 16 inch oak blocks that are about 20 feet long. Um, so obviously, you know, finding oak blocks that big can be a challenge, but, um, you know, so that's what that looks like when that comes out. And here we are, you know, these were cut in, the, in our fabrication shop, brought out, out on site, and they'll be placed on that re rehabilitated gate. And there they are just 
putting it on the gate, making some fine adjustments. And there's the miters. That's, that's as I said, that's a finished gate and that's what it looks like when it's done and uh, forms that nice tight seal right in the middle. So the pivots and sockets, that's a corner of that gate that it spins on that. Um, you can see that though, that's typically the condition we will see when, when we go in for one of these pump outs. And there's the new ones that will show up on site. Those are cast, cast steel. Um, those we have to order. And there's the, uh, the socket on, you know, so those two match up together and basically that gate will pivot on that corner. And there's one that's put in place, ready to go. They're placed in concrete and, uh, you know, the new concrete is replaced every time we do this. And that's what, you know, the completed miter gate looks like. It's, you know, new paint, new, new pivot sockets, new wood. Um, there's just a different picture of it. So, and again, this is done pretty much 100% with canal forces. And some minor concrete repair. Um, as I said, you know, we can't get into large concrete repair during the winter. Just very hard to work with concrete when it's, you know, 20 degrees out. But there are certain areas that we find that we need to do some new concrete. Um, here's another, this is a corner by a, a valve and a gate, new concrete going in. And this is what, you know, the lock will look like after. I mean, I showed you the picture earlier on with all the debris in there. Um, by the time we're done, all that debris is removed. You can see the, the rehabilitated gates on the end and, um, you know, ready to go for the season with all new compound components, which hopefully are good for another 10 years. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the projects we did this past winter to give you some reference of some of the, the things we get into and some of the issues we kind of get confronted with sometimes. Um, this is this was one pump out from our eastern region, E10. It's in Montgomery County in Cranesville. Again, original construction 1906. It did have a rehab in 1973. So that's what, uh, almost 50 years ago now, but um, you'll see some of the issues we, we encountered at this lock. Um, there's the lock pumped out. Um, the, you know, that the corner you could see right there where the, that's where the, the valve well goes and where the water will come into the lock. Well, right at that location, we found, you know, uh, quite a bit of concrete deterioration. You could see the size of, some of those gaps and some of those cracks that we found. Um, this is on the, this is overhead. So you're looking above where the water would go into that valve. You can almost see that concrete sagging with the crack. Um, you know, this was to try to get into this, this winter probably would have been much more than we could have handled and gotten done in time to, or, uh, to, to open. So we basically noted everything um, and the plan is to basically go back with a rehabilitation project in the near future. Um, we didn't feel it was anything that was gonna fail immediately, but something that we do need to address in the near future. Um, and, you know, I mean, the great thing about these locks is, is if you have an issue on one valve, you can still operate the, the, the lock on the other valve. It would be a little slower, but we still would be able to stay open to pass traffic. So, um, you know, if something was to happen here, we could still operate the lock and try to, to get in there to make some smaller repairs so that we can get up and running 100%. So our Western region, which is, you know, this part of the state from Syracuse westward out to Buffalo, um, we did, you know, four pump outs out there, all of them with their own unique challenges, which I'll go through some of them right now. Um, so we, we worked on lock 08 up in Oswego. This is an old historic picture of that lock. What I think is really cool is you see in these corners, those large concrete humps, those were siphons. Um, the lock was operated via siphon. Um, so it would take water in and, um, 
you know, I, we don't have any more anymore. So this is, you know, I don't even know exactly how that works because this was done away with a long time ago. But um, it, it was one of the only locks that was operated via that siphon. And we still, you know, you still can see some remnants of it when you're out there, some of the old tunnels. Um, but thought that was pretty cool. Um, so here, you know, we were planning to get in there and do a full pump out this winter. Um, as you can see, we were getting ready. We were getting ready to set up our coffer dam. But what we ran into is um, the DOT recently replaced, I, I believe that's the, um, the 104 bridge right in Oswego for anyone who's familiar with that. And when they rebuilt the bridge, they made it a little bit wider. So as you can see, here's the, um, you can see the piers there. So what happened is when we tried to go set this coffer dam, we lost about four feet to be able to get those sheets down in there. So we, we finally did get sheets in there, but then what we noticed is because of the high water this fall on Lake Ontario and many areas, we were having a hard time keeping the lock pumped out because those sheets kept with the water of the lake coming in and going down and kept moving those sheets in and out. So we basically had to go back to the to the drawing board there. And um, what we came up with, uh, this is just a couple more pictures of us trying to get the, uh, the lock pumped down and, and we really didn't have any luck. We came up with an idea of, um, you know, putting our sheets down into a, a steel channel on the bottom of the, the surface so that when they sat down in there, they couldn't, the bottom of those sheets couldn't go anywhere. So we had to bring a, a contractor in with a diver. They had to do this all underwater, you know, fabricated that channel, bolted it in underwater again. And then we had them come in and help us set the coffer dam again. And this time it worked. Um, but unfortunately, by the time we designed this and got it in there, it was literally probably a few weeks ago. So, you know, lesson learned, we're going to go back there again this next winter. Um, but now we know we have a system that's going to work. Um, I said the last time we did this, we didn't have the issue with the bridge. So we were able to pump it out 10 years ago and didn't have some of the same problems. But again, this was something we didn't anticipate. But, you know, we kind of adjusted on the fly. So now we have a good idea what to do this coming winter. Um, so another pump out is in lock, tw lock 29 in Palmyra. Of all the pump outs we did this winter, this was by far the most work at any of the locks. This, as you'll see on some of these photos, this was a full blown pump out. We were, you know, entire lock was pumped down, replaced all four valves, worked on all the miter gates. Um, by far our most successful pump out all winter, but um, you can see when we took those gates off and laid them down, quite a bit of deterioration. Um, I believe these are original 111 year old gates. So, um, you know, we got in there though, we did several repairs. Um, and as you can see, I mean, these are some of the, maybe that last slide shows it better, but you know, these are the conditions that our folks are working in all winter. Um, they're out in all the elements every day. Um, you know, they may be able to go get warm for 10, 15 minutes, but then they're pretty much right back at it. So, you know, I give them a lot of credit for the hard work that they do in these conditions and they do a great job. Um, and then you could say that's the, the pivot that's been replaced along with a plate there because some of that, that steel wasn't the greatest. Um, but that's, again, some of the work our folks did. And there's just another shot of it, um, the new coin wood on the corner. And then here's the, again, the cofferdam that was set up. You can see a lot of ice and snow out there. I mean, this, many of you know, this January was just brutal with temperatures many days, you know, below zero, so. And here's our guys, these are the new, um, these are the rails that get put into those corners that that valve will ride on. Again, these are all fabricated by our own folks. You know, they'll drill all those holes precisely. So when they get out there, 
they, they know exactly where it's going because again, they're working down in that dark tunnel, you know, it might be 20 degrees down there. So, you know, all that work that we can have done in the shop before they get out there, it just helps them have their job go a lot smoother. So. And there's just another photo of the pumped out lock. Again, some of the debris that was in there that we found, um, you know, the, the, these ladders are what they'll go up and down to get from the top of the lock to get down into those tunnels so that they can work on those valves and other elements that they need to get to. And this is just something I wanted to show you. Um, some of you may have been familiar last year around this time, it was the week before we were ready to open. We had a uh, small section of embankment fail right out adjacent to this lock, right near the, um, there's an old aqueduct, the Ganaragua Creek aqueduct that the embankment adjacent to it failed. So, you know, we spent some part of the season at lower water levels till we could get some of that temporarily fixed. And one of the solutions we came up with to try to run water through that area, because it used to go over a spillway that was next to the, the, the aqueduct, was to feed water through, this is the old original powerhouse that used to be used there to generate power at that site. So there's no turbines in there anymore, but there's still valves down in there that you can pass water. So we kind of did some repairs here. We, we always pass some water, but the amount that we needed to pass because of that, we needed to make some modifications here. So came up with this idea. And then, you know, at the end of this season, we still we had to get in there and put these new trash racks that you see across the opening. So that was kind of, it was just happened to be at the same site. So our folks did that as well um, to finish that part of that project up. So this was the third pump out. This is Lock E32 in Pittsford. Um, this was, um, we worked on one end of this lock last year. We have a, a little bit smaller crew out there. So we tried to do it over a two year period. Um, so we've came in and finished the other end, but these are, you can see, these are the valve cabinets where all the controls for those valves are. And, you know, they were taken out, totally sandblasted, repainted. Um, here's some of those rails that those valves ride on in the shop, you know, with the final holes being drilled into them. Um, there's the old valves coming out, headed to Waterford. And there's, you know, some of the, the equipment going back in after it's been painted. Um, a little bit of concrete deterioration you can see along the outer edge that was, some of that was repaired as well. And that's just a kind of, so again, some of the conditions they were working in. Um, a lot of snow and ice this year. It was really tough, but you know, they got a lot of work done. And just a couple more photos of the some of the finished product going back in the valve wells. And then the last project is out in Lockport. Um, anyone who's been out there, you could see the old, the old flight of five adjacent to the new double lock that's there. Um, a real unique, great site. A lot of visitors go there. It's, it's, uh, it's awesome out there. So, so there, um, again, we were planning to do a lower end of the lock um, we ran into some issues with some higher water and also some, we've been keeping the water a little higher out there into the fall for some of the, um, to provide more water to some of the fishing streams in that area. And it's been a great success. People have been, you know, they're salmon fishing along some of those creeks that they haven't been able to do in years. So, but the only, you know, the other side of that is it, it takes a little longer for us to be able to start our projects because that water is a little higher. But uh, what you see here where that old flight of five is, there's a couple sets of gates that we use that, that old lock structure to pass water to feed that pool. So we needed to get in there and do some work to those valves. And that's what you're seeing here in the actual um, operators that operate those valves. So that was part of it. Um, we also, you know, we had some difficulties trying to set the lower coffer dam there as well. Um, 
it's been some time since we've had to set a coffer dam there because typically the water has been much lower. But this year, um, you know, we, we played around with it. We did finally get it set. Again, some lessons we learned. We're going to go back there again this fall and finish that project up. So, um, you know, some valuable lessons learned and moving forward, we pretty much know what we need to do there. And as you can see, here it is, the cofferdam going in on that lower end. Um, this is just a quick video I'd like to play. Um, since we've been with NIPA for the last, the New York Power Authority for the last five years, they have a great video department. So they've been working with us on creating some great videos that, you know, for the work our folks do. So I'm gonna try to play this. This is just some of the winter work we did out in the West this year. So just a little recap of, I think, everything we kind of talked about already with a nice little video. So um, some of those are on YouTube. You can go watch them anytime you want. So, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I guess we'll open it up for questions, Derek, is that? Yeah, um, and just for the folks on Zoom, if you could repeat the questions uh, before you get to them. Okay, sure. So any questions? We have some from the Zoom audience. Uh, Jerry asks, is there one lock that is harder than others to repair? Oh, let me see. One lock harder than others. Um, I, I, they're very similar, I would say. I think what, what makes some more difficult is um, just site conditions is a big one. Like some areas, for example, like um, thinking locally here up along the Oswego River, for example, you don't have a lot of room. So the lock may be, you know, you don't have room to lift those gates out and put them on level ground. So, you know, those are some of the areas where you are working off of scaffolding, um, don't have the luxury of having a lot of land to lay things out. Like if anyone's been up to say lock 05 up in Mineto, it's essentially on an island. So, um, you know, there's no taking those gates out and even taking the valves out because, you know, you may be lifting them quite a ways with a crane or putting them on a barge. I mean, you have to get pretty creative. So um, I would say site conditions is a big part of it. Um, also, you know, some of the locks that haven't had a rehab more recently, I think you're gonna find more issues when you get into those locks than some of the newer ones that have been re rehabilitated. For example, Lock 07 up in Oswego, we just rebuilt that a couple of years ago. So I imagine in seven or eight years when we go in there for a pump out, it's probably one of the best pump outs the guys have ever had to do because everything is pretty much brand new. Um, so, so, you know, it really depends on a lot of the site conditions. Uh, someone else asked, what is done with the zebra mussels that are removed? Okay. Right. So what is done with the zebra mussels? So we have, um, we have sites across our system. They're called upland disposal sites. And what those are are lands that we have, we own that we use, like, especially when we're dredging the canal. Um, so, you know, we have permits with the DEC, that we can bring materials from the canal into those sites. So, so that's one option. And then the other option is we'll work with the DC or others to bring them to an authorized uh, landfill that will take that type of material. But, you know, we can't just, can't just dump them anywhere. 
because of, you know, the nature of zebra mussels. So we, uh, we work with our environmental folks and make sure we're doing the right thing with, with those. Yep. Oh, John. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. There are some disposal um, areas adjacent to the Inner Harbor right there. Are there any plans that you're aware of for those um, couple of disposal sites? Well, so we have we have one that we still currently use, and we used that one. Oh boy, it's probably six or seven years ago when we we did dredge the harbor. Um, the issue down there is we had three sites, three disposal sites in there at one time because of all the siltation that came in. But you know, now you have buildings, you have other things that have been built on those sites. So pretty much, you know, the last time we used that, we had to go in, we had to empty that out, transport all that material to an authorized landfill so that we now could pump new material into it. Um, Cause it's very, it's limited in space, to be honest with you. It's a smaller upland disposal site. So, yes. Um, I was interested in the wood uh, side of this. I was up in uh, by, and I noticed that the floor was wood on bones. And of course the old fashioned bricks were wood. Your presentation suggested there was still wood being used in the room. Right. So, right. So the question was about the wood that we use and yes. So what we found is like those corner coins, which are, you know, where the corner is and the miters where they meet, we still use wood because, um, you know, we've tried, we tried like, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, I think it was called icky wood out of South America. I think everyone thought it's a really good wood. But it was so hard that we couldn't even cut. We had a hard time fabricating it and cutting it. So we've just settled on, you know, oak. Now there is like some, some areas you'll see along the gates where there's like rub strips that are, that were wood. I mean, we have tried like some new composites and even some rubber type like D seals. So some of that works, but I don't know, on, the, on those gates, we're still finding that the oak wood is the best. Um, and how about the floors? The floors are all concrete on the current locks, yeah. Unlike the old original Erie Canal locks, the new floors are all concrete. So, But you do see like um, some of the old aqueducts, for example, if you go out right here, limestone or butternut aqueduct, and you look at those floors on the underneath, that's all wood, and I'm pretty sure that was all oak. So, yep. Two more yeah. Zoom questions. Uh, someone asked, how does Cayuta Lake Dam support the canal? Cayuta? Yeah, Cayuta. Yeah, so Cayuta Lake is one of those, um, the reservoirs up near the Adirondacks. And I'm trying to, that water, I want to say that eventually flows into Hinkley Reservoir. So it's, it's sort of an, an upstream provider to some water that goes eventually to Hinkley, as far as I can remember, trying to follow all those chains of reservoirs. But um, so that's how that works. As I said, we had, um, there was several reservoirs up there, North Lake, South Lake, um, Sand Lake that all were built when the original 1800 Erie Canal was built to provide water to those. But once the Barge Canal was built, you know, we used a lot of the rivers basically. So some of that water was not needed anymore, but we still own those, those structures. Uh, another question we had is, it seems like the Champlain Canal had more issues is that true or just my impression, given that the last part of the canal system is a dead kayak? Um, I don't I wouldn't say there's more issues. Um, I mean, obviously if you live in that area, maybe there's more issues because you're more aware of them. But um, you know, that the Champlain actually opened a little bit before the Erie, um, a couple of years. So I mean, relatively it's a little older, but I think when you're talking a couple of years compared to 
being around a hundred, it's, you know, just a fraction of time, but, um, I wouldn't say more, um, you know, I think all the locks have their moments. <laughs> so, uh, Elizabeth asks, have you ever found anything unusual when you train the lock? A lot of shopping carts, um, <laughs> you know, I, some, well, cars. I mean, I, I remember one time back a few years ago, we, it, it wasn't when we drained the lock, but we had some, a company out doing some sounding. Um, so they get an idea of what the depth of the canals are and what the contours look like. So up around the Fulton area, um, they were doing some sounding up there and they actually found a, a car that was submerged under the water. So when they came in and they pulled it out, they ended up solving like a 25 year old mystery murder. I don't even know if it was a murder, but it was an issue that happened. And some of you are shaking your head. I think you're aware of that, but um, you know, cause the car, they never could figure out what happened to the car and the person was missing, but that was, um, that was one of the most unique ones I can remember <laughs> they found in the canal, but um, you know, you do find a lot of debris um, that we try to get to. It's, it's tough, especially in some of the Western part of the state where you, you drain the canal, but you still might have like a foot of water in there and it's that muck. So to try to get in there and remove stuff, it's, it's almost impossible, but um, we do try to get some of the larger items. Duncan Hay. Hey, Duncan. Uh, what locks are scheduled for pump out next? Week? Oh, I knew he was going to ask me that. Um, I, I know a few of them. Uh, we're going to be at lock CS two and three on the Cave of Seneca, obviously back to lock 08, uh, lock 33, back to lock 34. Uh, and I, my memory is, I, I'm not sure on the Eastern end which ones, but um, I know we do have some selected. I think we're going back to lock E21 because, uh, you know, our folks in Utica are busy. They're, they're in the middle of moving. They moved their shop out of the Utica Inner Harbor because Utica is going to be developing similar to the Syracuse Inner Harbor. So our folks were very busy out there, so they didn't get all their work done on their pump out. So they're going back there. But the other couple escaped me. So sorry, Duncan. Give me a call. I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, I've got one more question I can see at the moment. Uh, during the navigation season, what is the typical, what are typical mechanical failures that occur at the lock? All right. So I'll repeat the question. What are the typical mechanical failures uh, during the navigation season? So a lot of it is um, we get valve issues where, you know, you saw those valves that ride up and down. Sometimes you might get one that gets hung up, um, whether it's a, a wheel issue or sometimes, you know, you can imagine if a tree, just say a tree somehow happens to float into that valve well and that when that valve is trying to come down and it sits on that log, um, you know, things like that. Sometimes gate issues, you may get a corner one gate that uh, we may be having an electrical or some type of mechanical issue. So you might have to go a day or two with only operating one gate. So we may have to limit the size of the boat that can go through to maybe 20 feet, um, which, you know, most of the boats would, we would be able to accommodate. Um, but those are the, those are the main ones. And usually, you know, they're resolved pretty quickly um, unless we have like a component that fails and we would have to get down into the, the valve well or into the lock to replace it. Typically it's a type of electrical issue or something like that, that we can quickly resolve and get the lock back up and running. So, yes, John. So, I mean, what's your, you know, from your engineering perspective, what's the most fascinating? I mean, I go to the locks and I see this concrete that's, what'd you say, hundred years old? Yeah. And I look at the motors and the motors are like GE motors for like, you know, 50 years ago, I don't, can't remember the dates. What, what do you find most fascinating with the whole engineering? Uh, yeah, I tell you, since the day I came here, I just find that the way they, I mean, that they built these, I mean, even the old original canal, when you look at the, 
the old laid up stone locks that were built in the early 1800s with, you know, no machine power. I mean, it was all steam. Eventually they had steam, but a lot of it was just with mules and hand dug. And that just fascinated me that, you know, they could do all that back better. Now I know like over in Europe, right. They've had canals for much longer than that, but you know, when you look at the scale of what they did here, I mean, and then the other part of like the current machinery that it is all, a lot of it's all original, you know, that it's still operating like the day it really was put in. Um, you know, to me, it's just fascinating that it's still running. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't find that very often that things are a hundred years old and operating like the day that they, they were put in. So they did it right, I guess, is what, you know. Yes. You have a photo of uh, one of the original old uh, locks that you used in there. Uh, who was the closest one in that position to here? I, I think the little walls, I see the skeletons of the old one. Or is this in the uh, on this side? Oh, yeah. I saw old well, 1842 locks, but they were not in that position. Yeah, so um, I would say the closest to here is probably Camillus. There's the old, um, there's a trail there that goes through Camillus, and they will take you on a little boat dinner ride, but they, I believe, still have some of the old locks that they preserved that you can see in person. Um, little bit fur. I mean, there are some scattered across the way, like out in um, Newark, Lyons. There's some of the old locks that some volunteer groups have preserved. But I guess the best working locks that you may see right now are out in Lockport. That flight of five that I showed you, the, the city actually, over the last, I don't know, 10 years, they've been getting grants to refurbish that to the original um, the way it, and they have a boat that they will do demonstrations just like the way it was originally. So, yeah. Just a question since we're talking about uh, locks failing, it's a uh, little false. That yep. lock, what is the pump out for that? Like, if it has a totally different gate. Yes, and that pump out is our largest. Uh, so they asked about Little Falls, uh, you know, what that pump out like. Yeah, so that is our largest lift, 45 feet, I believe. So, you know, just that alone that you're, you know, you're walking down scaffolding that's 45 feet high. Um, so that makes it unique. Uh, the one end, the it would be the eastern lower end, doesn't have typical um, miter gates. It has a drop down gate there because of the height so um yeah so just you know just the size of that the the drop is makes it interesting but then also that gate on the lower end is entirely different and again last year around this time um it was may i remember may 12th may 13th we had one of the large gears that operates that large gate it uh a tooth broke off it so we had to essentially close that lock for a couple of days. We brought in a large crane because it was right at the opening of the season to operate that gate up and down manually so that we could pass. I think we did it a couple of times a day. We would pass boats just until we could get that gear replaced. But I mean, that gear, that was a six foot diameter gear um, that we had to send to a, a machine shop. They were able to bolt on a, a, a tooth just so that we could get by for the season until we could actually replace that, which that gate is going to get a rehab in a couple of years anyway, and it'll all be addressed. But, you know, a lot of times that's what we have to do. We have to do something to get by till we can make a more permanent fix. So, was there a question back? Did you have your hand raised earlier, sir? Uh, you kind of answered it uh, about I was just going to ask you what, what was your impression of the engineering and uh, what sets apart this. I know when doing the tours, we always point out the, uh, the tremendous uh, endurance of these plots. So you kind of asked that question. Uh, this, the 
does that really strike you over the years to see what was accomplished? Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, just you know, these monoliths of concrete at these locks that are, you know, several feet wide and, you know, they're standing the test of time. Um, you know, obviously when we go in and do a rehab, we will replace it. But even like when we rehabilitated lock 07 up in Oswego, you know, we took off, I forgot, maybe a foot, foot and a half of the surface concrete. But when we got into the interior, I mean, that concrete was still, still solid, you know, without, you know, that it wasn't reinforced with concrete. It was just large slabs of concrete poured a hundred years ago and it was still in pretty good shape. So, as I said, they did it right <laughs> when they did it, so. Yeah, one more question on here. Yeah. Um, I'm asking about dredging done between uh, Waterford and the Oswego Canal. Uh, there are some shallow spots in the navigation info page I'm wondering if those have been addressed. Will a boat with a seven and a quarter foot draft have any known issues? Um, I think we we have been dredging for probably a month or so now in certain areas. Um, obviously, we can't get to all of them at once because we're you know have only so many dredge uh, operations. But um, we try to keep that information updated on our website so that we will have those those sounding, the sounding information to tell people. Um, most of those areas, you know, the siltation will happen, you know, right at the creek mouth on one side of the, the canal channel. So usually you'll see a buoy that will get you around the lowest depths. Um, you know, if someone has a specific question, we have, uh, you know, a number that they can call and we can walk them through with our navigation manager of, you know, but I, I think, most boats seven and a half feet are not going to have a problem, especially after we've gotten to some of those areas and dredge them. So, but if they have more specific questions, they can definitely call our, our number and we can help, help walk them through that. So. Everyone in the chat is thanking you. I'm okay. Thank well, you. thanks. This is a great, great audience. So thank you. Good crowd. <laughs>